well, kind of my, well, I'd call it my education kind of started from a young age, um, growing up in a large farm um, in central rural Portugal, um, where my grandfather kind of had, um, yeah, something crazy like fifteen hundred sheep and a hundred cattle and pigs and goats and you name it, horses. He had it. Um, he trained horses for bullfighting. Um, he a lot of famous bullfighters of the at the time would come to him with um, their horses to, and he would kind of train them to kind of dance to a certain music that they played during the bullfights. Um, he also had bulls himself, so he'd uh, breed a couple of bullfights. He had dogs. Um, some were used for the uh, controlling the, the bulls, others were used for hog hunting. Um, kind of started from there, really. Um, <laughs> Going back at the age of three, four, five years of age, that's when I kind of that's my first memories of um, being involved in dogs and and learning the uh, the basics. Well, from the young age, it was kind of like you know local dogs, the so Portuguese and Spanish dogs is what my um, is what my grandfather had. Um, he had um, at the time you just kind of call them Spanish dogs. Now you'd you'd call them Milanos and Valanos now. But at the time, going back to the late eighties, early nineties, they were just Spanish hunting dogs, you know. Right. Um, you had a couple of local Portuguese breeds, um, dogs like um, Hafila Linjan, which is like a local shepherd type breed, used for you know looking after the sheep from wolves and foxes. Um, you had a couple of like um, what you'd call now Camusera um, de Ardes and Brabada Tassir, which are kind of like rare. Still relatively rare breeds, but they're pretty much, you know, used for sheep and mm -hmm. and um, cattle and stuff. And with those dogs, you'd kind of cross in a bit of bull blood, so a bit of put bull or a bit of staff blood into them to, um, well, not staff, just pit bull, because you had no staffs, so it was just pit bulls that you had, mm -hmm. um, just to add a bit more venom to them. And that, you use them dogs for a bit of hog hunting. Right. Um, since then, I've had my own kind of dogs I've always kind of had a, a bull breed around me whether it was a staff or a pit bull around me I've always had them around um, at the moment I've got four here I've got a little staff bitch an English bull terrier and I've got two wheat and terriers um, at the, that's what I've got at the moment here oh. to be honest they just brought back a lot of, mem a lot of memories for me um, they I mean, when I started off, um, I'd obviously seen them, you know, just pet ones um, around, you know, walking around with their owners and stuff, uh, seen them at a couple of different shows. I'd seen a couple of working ones as well. And it was just really through the page. I met a gentleman um, who, who's who been breeding them pretty much all his life and had them all his life. Um, and when I went to speak to him for my book, um, I saw his dogs and I was just in complete awe of them. Um, the type, their structure, their build, their character, their temperament, everything about them. Um, it was just um, reminding me a lot of the dogs that my grandfather used to have to work the bulls, work um, the cattle and hog hunting and everything else. So it just reminded me a lot of those dogs and that's what I thought I'd want. That's what I've got. <laughs> yeah, I mean... There's a lot of there's a lot of different information out there. I'm a bit of a, a history buff, so when it comes to history stuff, I'm it's one of my things that I'm very much into history, the genetics and breedings, and mm -hmm. and you know I'm getting a lot more into that kind of stuff, of things you know structure wise and, and all that stuff. But regarding the wheat and terriers and the other Irish breeds, um, and it's one of the things I cover in my book is that um, you got four Irish. Well, four different types of Irish terry breeds. You've got the Irish terrier, which is the leggy red type. You've got the Kerry blue terrier, which is the blue coat with like a almost a water type dog jacket on it. And then you've got the <laughs> short legged Glen of Mile terrier. And then you've got the Wheaton terrier. Um, I mean, I could give you my side of what I think is their history, but obviously everyone else will have their own um, version. Basically, they would kind of in my opinion, the original they were kind of multifunctional dogs. So mm -hmm. when the Irish were under, under the English control, 
they weren't actually allowed to have uh, purebred dogs. Okay, so I think mm. to get around that was by the Irish, you know, farmer to create a type of dog that mm. allowed them to not only fly under the radar, but also have a dog that they could feed just one or two dogs to feed instead of having three, four, five different dogs, mm-hmm. for a variety of functions. Um, and these dogs had a bit of everything. Them they would have had a bit of uh, Irish Wolfhound, a bit of Bull Breed, a bit of Terrier. Um, anything that worked and kind of bit even sh- sheep dog, anything that kind of added a little bit more to to make it as a multifunctional dog as possible, they would have bred them into, I'm sure. Um, and that kind of gave rise to the the, very, the four terrier, Irish terrier breeds that we have now. Mm-hmm. Um, with time, I think more towards the early, early well, beginning of the 1900s I think kind of um, they began to be a bit more towards the Kerry Blues and the Irish and the Glens and the Wheatons were um, in history wise were being tested on variety of hunting um, Mm -hmm. but mainly it was uh, the testers more which is badger hunting basically it was a test of um, strength and Mm -hmm. courage and that was being run by the Kennel Club. The Irish Kennel Club was running those tests up until the mm-hmm. 60s, 70s. Wow. And the wheat and terriers just seemed to have come out slightly better than the other three breeds. Um, mm-hmm. And it's kind of kept its fire about it. And um, I'm kind of glad that there are still people out there keeping the the real like, wheat and terrier going. Um mm-hmm. As it was in the old days, I mean, and I hope it continues. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, um, book was uh, was a bit of a passion. I'm a bit, like I said, I'm a bit of a history geek. Um, I do like writing. Um, the book was a bit of a. It was more of a request from different members actually on the dog page itself. Um, the dog page started as a, just as a hobby really, just a place where I could. Um, not only share pictures and informational breeds that probably the normal dog fancy or the normal dog lover doesn't see every day, but also share information about, you know, their history, you know, their original purpose, and also show people what a dog should look like or what a dog is meant to look like. Mm -hmm. Um, Because a lot of people go to shows, you know, dog shows, and they see these dogs and they think, well, that's what's meant to look like when... You know, a lot of these dogs have got a lot of health issues, a lot of structures, bad breathing problems, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it was just an opportunity to kind of share as many different breed types, you know, show people what um, good breeding is, bad breeding, um, and just highlight any kind of health issues as well and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um and the book came from that, really. A couple of people had asked me, you know, why don't you do a book um, um, covering a couple of certain different breeds? And that's what I did. Um, the book took me a little while to do. So I said just life in general getting in the way and stuff. Mm-hmm. I pretty much visited everyone that I interviewed for the book, apart from two people, which one was in Australia, which is uh, the Bull Arab chapter, and the other one was in America. Um, who's a pit bull breeder. Everyone else was in Europe, so I pretty much uh, visited them, spent some time with them, um, saw their dogs, um, saw their kennels, saw some of their dogs work, um, just had a good sit down and chat with a lot of these people and just got their views and their opinions on their dogs and and the history of their line and what their aim was and what the purpose was, what they were doing really. Mm Mm-hmm. Pugs and English Bulldogs, I mean, they were, um, I mean, they've, they've changed a lot. Um, I mean, you, it's not difficult to have a look on Google. Um, just a simple Google search will show you that a lot of these breeds, um, they've changed so much. I mean, they've got the same function. They were, you know, the pug was originally nothing more than um, a lady's dog, but it was, you know, it was a lot more long-legged. Its tail wasn't mm-hmm. as good. It was. It had a much longer back. Um, it's just 
you know, I, you know, I've got no problems with shows. You know, people are entitled to do, you know, what they want to do when they want to do it. Um, and and I'm I'm all for that. I'm very, you know, I'm happy to help people. I'm happy to give people advice as and where I can help. My thing is, it's just breeding to match a standard that, you know, if you're 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 almost limiting the gene pool. Well, you are limiting the gene pool by breeding dogs to match a particular standard because what's happening is there's no care for that dog's health. You know, you know, let's, you know, I'm not going to get, you know, you know, full details, but you know, if you're breeding for a dog for a certain height, um, certain curly tail, certain length of muzzle, et cetera, it's just all these little, it sounds like tiny little adjust, adjustments, but actually with time and consistently breeding for those tiny little adjustments, what you're doing, you're just limiting the dog further and further and further away from its original form. And what's ended up happening is, is exactly what's happened with the English Bulldog and the Pug, where you have the dog, where you know, it costs you a bomb to buy one, and then it costs you a bomb to keep it alive and ticking because of so many health issues mm-hmm. reasons unfortunately have because of of being bred to these um extremities Go ahead. No, no, sorry, sorry to interrupt you I, th- I think i mean with a lot of these breeds i think the only way forward is there's got to be a change in the standard that's the first thing in the show standards and the only people that can do that are the, the kennel clubs um and the breeders have got to be open-minded about that they've got to be willing to to put the work in and the effort in to make their dogs healthier and just more structurally sound um and not only that some breeds will require um outcrossing there are a lot of people going about pure breeds pure breeds pure breeds i mean you go back in time there was no pure pure breed you had the dog that you know looked like such and such and it did the job that you wanted it to do you would breed it to the next farmer down the road which had a slightly different appearance about it but did the same job you would breed it to it because it was a good dog and did the same job that you're looking for do you know what i mean absolutely um and that's how over time types begin to develop um you know well, I like that type, you know, you know, it's doing the job that I want. So, you know, I'll breed to that dog more often. I'll breed, you know, I'll base my, my line, my dogs around that dog. Um, but yeah, that crossing for some breeds is going to be necessary. And I don't see anything wrong with that. I think if anything, it's, it'll bring fresh blood in and it should also correct a lot of the faults that have been created by man. Yeah. I mean, um, it's not going to be easy, but I do think it's, you know, these things start at home. What do you have in your own house? What what are you doing? What can you do um, to help people, inspire people or give people advice? Um, and whether that's with my book or my, you know, my dog page, you know, showing people different dog breeds that they'd never heard of or um, a type of bull terrier or type of wheat and that they'd never seen and they're seeing for the first time. I mean, those. I mean, that that is a tiny drop in the massive ocean of the dog world. But mm-hmm. I hope that it gives people just that little bit of um, inkling to get a dog that is fit for purpose, that is healthy, that is mm-hmm. structurally sound, that um, will live, you know, 10, 12, 14, 15 years. Um, that won't need to go to the vet, you know two, three, four, five times a year, Mm -hmm. you know, all these kind of things. I mean, it's just, you know, it's heartbreaking when you lose a dog and, you know, you see a lot of, you know, especially, I mean, the internet's a wonderful thing. I mean, it's also a bad thing. It's also quite negative in some issues, but it's a wonderful thing because you get to connect with a lot of these people who are dog fanciers, dog lovers, you know, all around the world. Um, But also, you also see the downside of that where... Um, you know, you hear these stories, you know, someone bought a puppy, you know, you just spent two thousand pounds, two and a half thousand pounds on a French bulldog, you know, it was everything that they wanted, their child wanted it for years and years, and then they get it six months later, it's got some heart condition or some kind of health condition, uh, you know, because the breeder didn't test the parents or the breeder didn't 
test the puppies or get the puppies checked over by the vet properly. And it's just, you know, it's heartbreaking to see these stories. But they happen and they will continue to happen. Well, money, I think money, money's a massive thing, but I think also people's ego. I think, I think yeah. people's ego is, is a massive, massive issue. I mean, I'm, like I said, I, you know, I'm not about, I've never made any money from any of the dogs, to be honest. I don't sell dogs, I don't breed dogs, and I don't intend on selling or breeding any dogs. For me, it's about having um, having that company, having you know, being happy with what I'm feeding. I'm not, mm-hmm. I don't, I'm not interested in anybody else's dogs and what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and you see that on my dog page. You know, I'll post dogs of people that I'm, I'd call friends of mine and people that I talk to on a regular basis. But I'll also post pictures of people's dogs that I don't get on very well or I don't think very highly of. Mm-hmm. But it's not the dog's fault. So I post, it's, I keep it about the dogs and not about the people behind the dogs. Mm-hmm. Um, I think with the internet as well, it's, I think if anything, it, sh- it should have actually helped a lot of breeds because you no longer have to, you know, look in your area for a specific stud. You now have got the whole world where you can contact a breed on the other side of the world and go, you know what? I've got a really nice bitch here. Um, mm-hmm. There's some nice dogs, you know, in the UK, but actually I quite fancy um, trying something a bit different. I like the way your dog works. Can I get some semen off your dog, you know, import it, whatever. But I think people, one, don't want to spend the money, and two, they're almost too proud to ask for that help. They're almost too proud to um, go down that route. They'll rather use sometimes an inferior dog because it's local to them or it's one of their friends or it's uh, one of their dogs that they bred themselves than actually mm. using something so powerful like the internet to its full capabilities and using and getting the best possible dog for their bitch. Say an English bulldog, just because, you know, that's, that's my breed. Uh, what, what do you think a good outcross would be to, to, to fix some of the negatives um, I mean, this is just my opinion, and, and opinions are, are just that everyone will have one based on their own um, experiences and and beliefs. But I mean, you've got some very good old English bulldogs being bred by a variety of people um, who are working. You know, some in man work, some in hunting, um, some in obedience. Um, some in French ring work. You got some real good people out there, not only in America but also in the U- in the UK and Europe, breeding some really nice old English bulldog types. Um, I don't think an outcross to a male from these lines would be too extreme. Mm-hmm. Or maybe a normal English bulldog breeder, um, because they're still breeding to a very similar type, although structurally better and healthier. But it's not too much of an extreme outcross, um, and that will bring in a lot of, like I said, a lot of much needed blood, um, mm-hmm. and just give the English bulldog a little bit of a kick of life um, in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah, I've always felt that something similar to that, or even maybe like a, a little bit of Staffy or, or American Pitbull Terrier in it as well. Mm. I mean, I mean, you can, absolutely. There's enough, you know that that would be the almost the ideal. But it just, I just feel like with these people, you got to take baby steps. You right. can't, you know, you got to teach them to crawl before you can teach them to walk and run. And uh, I think. To teach them to crawl, you've got to start slow and very close to what they know and what they've got already got. And the old English bulldog kind of ticks those boxes, in my mind, in my opinion, um, as probably an ideal cross for someone that uh, breeds English bulldogs. Mm-hmm. What are some of the breeds that are really interesting you uh, today that most people haven't heard of? I start off quite young being involved in dogs. Um, you know, I remember my granddad working his dogs on the farm and going out, you know, hog hunting with him, you know, on horseback, you know, wow. uh, you know, and um, being with a couple of his friends and 
And at the time, I probably didn't appreciate, you know, being on the farm, I didn't appreciate watching him train horses or watching work his dogs on, you know, on the bulls and the cattle. And I didn't appreciate those breeds, you know. I kind of, uh, you know, oh, look at, you know, I was all straight, more straight away drawn to these, um, to the pit bulls, and you know, as I came over to the UK to the staffs and you know, the bull breeds. But I think as I got older, I'm definitely appreciating a lot more of these local breeds, whether it's in Portugal, Spain, Italy, and France. You know, there's some great um, local. Um, very old working breeds uh, and a lot of these breeds have actually given rise to a lot of the breeds that we have today and people just don't know that you know i could tell you about the um a very well-known portuguese breed um in the north um who who a lot of people don't know but actually gave rise to the um the labrador um you know and then the Labrador obviously has helped create the Chesapeake Retriever uh, mm -hmm. with a bit of Irish Water Spaniel uh, and a little bit of Setter Blood and Bloodhound Bland. And so it's sort of just like a vicious circle. And that's why I'm not a big fan um, of pure breeds because all these dogs have began from somewhere. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, I'm, you know, Dogs like the Fila de San Miguel, uh, which is a Portuguese dog breed, which is uh, my grandfather had at the time, is becoming a lot more and more popular. You're seeing them uh, in America, uh, mm -hmm. across across um, across Europe. I don't know of any in the UK yet, but yeah, they're definitely becoming a lot more popular. Um, breeds like. The dog Osado, the Italian dog Osado, is becoming a lot more popular as well. Um, again, all these breeds they've been they've been in existence for hundreds of years, um, but only now they're coming to light. Um, and they've been doing what they were bred to do for years. If you still go to the Azores Islands now, and I have been, you'll see these Felid Samigals, you know, tied to the back of a truck. Uh, the truck's full with um, milk tins and milk barrels mm -hmm. and um i'll pay someone good money to go and rob and st or steal one of those milk barrels and uh just <laughs> just to see what happens because i know they wouldn't do it yeah mark is a nice guy um he he's a very proud um a Soriano, which is yeah. a gen uh, gentleman from the Azores. he's got some nice dogs and I, and i and he's on the right path of not only keeping the original traits of the breed but going with the times and that's obviously i mean the breed originally was there's tails were docked and the ears were cropped in a in a round shape and that was supposedly to help the dogs not only getting hurt by the bulls that they were working the country but any getting any kind of infections from the pollen from the flowers um docking and cropping is now illegal um so he's moving with the times they're now having to breed for a nice tail set which i'm slightly against because it goes back to trying to match the standard again but i think out of a lot of the breeders him and a few others are doing a decent job in going with the times keeping the breed alive um to as close to its true origins as possible um, it's a difficult question because my, my, I mean, in my youth, I remember my grandfather and my godfather doing the docking and the cropping themselves on the farm with mm -hmm. nothing more than a pen knife. So to me, it was something that I was brought up around and seen being done on a regular basis. Um, I think it's got its uses. I think it's in some breeds and the type of work that they do is a must but doing it just to make a look make a dog look hard or dog look cool or i don't see the point in that at all mm -hmm. if we're just doing it for the way a dog looks or to me that's just absolutely pointless 
you do it solely for the purpose of trying to prevent an injury to the dog or, you know, because if the dog is doing its original per- its original job, um, then the docking and the cropping could save um, a major injury being caused to the dog. Mm-hmm. People be and do what they want to do, but my personal preference is unless you're Unless it's got a use for docking and cropping, I don't see the point of it. Yeah, no, I, I definitely understand that. What do you know about the dog of Sardo? Is it, it's a breed of, of course, that I've just learned about in the last year just by doing my little research online. And um, yeah, the dog, the dog of Sardo has got a lot of similarities with the feel of some girl. Again, it goes back to that, you know, form follows function. Um, mm-hmm. You've got two breeds. In Europe, where both have been bred to do the same purpose, same type of work for several hundred of years. So it's not surprising there's a lot of similarities between the two. Um, Sardo obviously comes from Sardinia, which is a, a small island in the Mediterranean. A lot of the breeders will say that, you know, the dogs have, you know, pretty much, you know, have not changed for 2,000 years um, you know, they've all that you know, any changes have been very minimal. I probably wouldn't agree with that, um, just because of where the history of the island itself it's been under various control over the years. I think it's been controlled by the Italians, the Spanish, the French, the Austrians. It's been controlled and been influenced by so many different nations that the same type of dog has obviously existed on the island, but over the years there would have been minor changes, minor outcrosses, you know, and that's just not for the dog, the way the dog looks, just different influences and different nations coming to the island and bringing their own dogs in and, you know, probably mixing with the local dogs that existed there. Mm -hmm. And they're definitely kind of a a farming and utility dog. Yeah, they're, they're... there again, there will be a quite fiery temperament, just like the filled sunny girl. They'll be used on farms to guarding, protecting the farm, the livestock. Um, I know some of them have been used for hunting for different bits of hunting as well. I think some were used um, have used as been used as war dogs, um, going back to the early 1900s. Um, you've also got a couple of other. You've also got the cane finesse which is again another very it's another Italian breed very similar to the dog Osado. Again, very similar type, um, similar function. Um, again, has existed in that area for many many years. Um, yeah, again, again, form follows function. Another dog that's you know very similar to other types of dogs that do the exact same function. Um, yeah, you got, in Brazil, I mean, you got the Fila Brasileiro, which is the their Mastiff, original Mastiff hunting type. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, and that's, and that's changed a lot. Uh, I was actually speak. I've got a gentleman there um, who is a massive, massive Fila Brasileiro fan, and he has been involved with the breed since a very young age. And he lives, you know, somewhere very remote in... Um, Minas Gerais, uh, which is a very remote, almost central area, and he is breeding for a much healthier, you know, better structured dog, you know, structurally sound dog. Mm. Because again, once again, another breed, you know, has been affected by the foreign breeds going into Brasil. Um, You know, if you look at pictures of the Fila Brasileira from the early you know, from the 1910s, 1920s, you know, you got a, a certain type of dog. As you get to the 50s, 60s and 70s, you begin to get a dog that looks a lot more like a bloodhound. And that's because Mastiff, English Mastiff, bloodhound blood, blood has been added to those dogs to make them bigger, thicker, um, more wrinkled, you know, just more loose skin. And that was the type that they were looking for, you know. Um, mm-hmm. that breeders were beginning to breed for, you know, 60s, 70s, and 80s. But you go back in time, these dogs would have descended from Portuguese and Spanish war dogs taken to Brazil. 
you know, they would have descended from the early dogs that created the Fila de San Miguel. The Fila de Tercera, which is now an extinct breed, would have played a major role in these breeds. And, you know, the Spanish Alano, the Spanish Mastiff, and then you've got the, then you've got the Portuguese breeds as well. Like the, the Portuguese did have um, an Alano type dog, which was called an Alano, which is unfortunately now extinct. Mm -hmm. About their own shepherd breeds, you know, like the Rafaela de Alentejo, um, the Castro Labrero, which is the dog I spoke to you earlier on, mm -hmm. now, the ancestor to today's Labrador. Um, all these breeds would have been taken over to to Brazil and South America, and there, that's where you know they over there once they, once there, they then were obviously crossed together and new breeds were created. But a Fila Brasileira originally would have been, you know, big game hunter and a cattle dog. Mm -hmm. We see a lot of these Fila Brasileiros um, who probably couldn't do half an hour's work in in a proper ranch chasing cattle or hunting um, big game. They couldn't do it. So it's nice to see people like that gentleman in Brazil um, him and a group of his friends working together to try and breed a better dog, fit for function, and actually working the dog on the farms with the cattle, you know, and going out in um, going out hunting with them. Um, that's the Fila Brasileiro. Then you've got, like you said, you've got the dog Brasileiro, which is a, a breed created in the 60s and 70s uh, by a gentleman, which. I'm going to say Dan Tush, but don't quote me because I can't mm -hmm. remember his name now. Mm -hmm. and, and that was a bit of, um, that was a bit of, um, you know, let's try this and see how, and see what happens breeding kind of. He had, um, I can't remember, the, I can't remember what, I think he had, I'm going to say he had, in, you, I don't want to say it and then be wrong, but you, Obviously, had an either a boxer on his mm -hmm. bitch, and he bred it to his neighbour's um, dog, which was either a boxer or an English puto, the opposite to whatever he had. Mm -hmm. And he was so happy with the resulting puppies that that is when his breeding program started. And his aim was to create a dog small enough to that anyone could have, including mainly the poorer members of brazil you know in their small house uh, mm -hmm. or you know they were driving to, you know to put in the you know the back of their you know in the back seat of their car or the front seat of their car to protect them from you know people breaking into their homes people breaking into their cars people mugging them and that was the whole purpose of that dog i know a bit of american staff terrier was added mm -hmm the 90s just to new add new genes and you know add a few more bits and that the original breeder felt were, were missing <coughs> that, that breed has pretty much stayed the same since he started and they've got a massive following in brazil um a massive following they're doing a lot of work they're doing a lot of um, french ring training a lot of obedience training just more designed for man work. It's not a hunting dog, not that I know of. I don't know of any being used for hunting. They are just purposely bred for protection and guarding abilities. Um, the Bulldog Campero, you've actually got two. You've got the Bulldog Campero and what they call the Bulldog Serrano. And that's, again, that's just like all breeds. You, they start off very well and then with time and as soon as money gets involved, um, things go downhill from there. And the Bulldog Campero is basically uh, what was left over of dogs similar to the dogs that created the Fila Brasileiro and, and some of the early English Bulldogs taken over to, to Brazil. And from that, they, they created a dog from some of the, the English Bulldogs taken and from the Fila da Tercera, which is a Portuguese Bulldog type breed, which is extinct. That actually had, it was a dog... Um, Renowned for its courage and strength, but its tail was actually kinked. Mm -hmm. So it had the nickname of Habu Torto, which literally means bent tail. And um, 
them breed, them dogs with the English Bulldog were, in my mind, would have been the ancestors of the Bulldog Campero. And again, they would have been used on the farm, you know, to work bulls, um, a bit of hunting, just general farm utility dogs. But as time went on, um, you know, wanting to get the breed recognised, wanting to write standards, the breed kind of lost its way a little bit. Um, and now you see a lot of these bulldog campers, they, they just look like fat old English bulldogs, basically. They are overweight, <laughs> over wrinkled, short muzzles, short legs. With, you know, breeding for colour, you're now seeing merles, you're now seeing tricolours, you're now seeing blues, which you never saw. You'd never seen these colours 20, 30 years ago. So the Bulldog Serrano is an offshot from the Bulldog Campero, and it was started by people who felt that the Campero was going down the wrong route, and they wanted to breed a type which... Um, continue to showcase the qualities of the original breed as close to its original form as possible. Um, so basically a fitter version of the Bulldog Campero. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, funnily enough, it's actually a friend of mine uh, okay. a gentleman by the name of Jose, and I played a little bit of a hand in that. Um, basically that breed was um, created in probably in the 16th, 17th century um, by basically you got just to give a little bit of history the Asores is a group of nine islands mm -hmm. uh, very proud people and so they should be and as there is a bit of a rivalry between the different islands um, so you've got San Miguel Island which is the create where the feel of the San Miguel comes from and then you've got the island of Tessera and Tessera literally means fair island so it's a fair island um, that was um, found upon arriving on the group of islands uh, in mm -hmm. Islam, back in the 15th century. And uh, they, there was obviously an existing base type, um, an existing feeler type, taken to the Azores from Portugal, mainland Portugal, from central Portugal. And from those early dogs taken from central Portugal, like the Portuguese Alano, uh, the Castro Labrero, and, you know, those kind of breeds. It gave rise to, in the San Miguel Island, the Fila de San Miguel, and in the, the Serra Island, the Fila de Tercera. The difference between the two breeds is that the Fila de Tercera was a, an island that was a lot more visited by foreigners, so there was a lot of influence from the French. From the sorry, French. sorry, I, I lost you right when you said the difference between the two and then it, it, it I lost you. Could you repeat? Yeah, no, Sorry. it's all right. The difference between the two, the two breeds is that in San Miguel, obviously it gave rise to the Fila de San Miguel in the Tercera mm -hmm. Island. Um, the Fila de Tercera was created. The original Fila de Tercera would have been a dog very similar to the early Fila de San Miguel, but because it was visited by, the French, the Spanish, the English, uh, it's just had a lot more influence. You know, when ships were coming from Europe to America or America to Europe, it was one of the islands, one of the pit stops, one of the islands that was used a lot more than the other islands. Even now you go there, there's a lot more culture, there's a lot more, um, there's a lot more touches from other nations on the Tessera Island. Mm -hmm. And the feel of the Tessera was created by adding a bit of early dog to Bordeaux and early English bulldog blood. We're talking the 17th century, so, you know, you know, English bulldogs and dog to Bordeaux look nothing like the breeds that we have here today. And, you know, mm -hmm. I'm talking about their ancestors in the 17th century. And that created a dog, not only had that had like a king tail, but... Um, was a lot of the time red in colour, and that red is believed to come from the French Mastiffs that mm -hmm. played a part in creating the Fila de Tercera. And the aim there was to create a Fila that was more bulldog type, less cattle dog, more bulldog type. So it was able to um, go into a ring or chase a, a bull, grab it by the ear or grab it by the nose and be able to pin it and drag it to where 
the owner needed. Uh, you know, and there's loads of stories of these dogs doing, you know, amazing acts of courage, you know, saving their owners um, from death, from being mauled by the bull and, you know, etc. But that breed, you know, it was actually registered. It was registered by the Kennel Club, the Portuguese Kennel Club in the early 1900s. But I think it was, it was at a time where, you know, that work was kind of going out of fashion. People weren't keeping semi-wild cattle. People weren't. Bullfighting was becoming a little bit less popular. And as dog shows kind of took over, people began breeding, going to other breeds. And you know, a lot of foreign breeds began hitting the, the Azores, began hitting Portugal. And that feel that to say the kind of just took a bit of a back step. They were kind of no, really no longer for, needed for a dog to go and pin a ball or grab a ball. And I think the last kind of known examples of that breed kind of died out in the 50s and 60s. Um, and whatever was left over that breed was added to the Fila de San Miguel. So a bit of that blood exists in today's Fila de San Miguel and a bit of that blood exists in the Barbado de Tercero, which is another Portuguese breed. Kind of like, um, kind of like, um, again, a hunting um, farm utility type dog. Um, looks a little bit like a Wheaton. Or, or like a Bouvier de Flanders, but slightly smaller in size. Mm -hmm. um, it's got a long coat. Um, yeah, it's that blood, that for the Cera blood has kind of gone into those breeds. And then there was a massive interest in the breed going into the late 70s, early 80s, where a lot of people... Um, were going to university, they were studying genetics, they were studying um, the, the original dog breeds and the original um, national breeds that Portugal had, or some had been lost, some were still just about hanging on. And that kind of sparked a massive interest in, the, in some of these lesser known Portuguese breeds that we had. And then there was a couple of gentlemen who kind of got involved and there was a few attempts of trying to recreate the breed using the Fila Brasileiro, the Fila de São Miguel and the English Bulldog. That didn't go very well. There's a couple of examples. I think you can still find some photos of those examples online. Um, and then last kind of, kind of when I started a page, the original page going back to 2013, um, I started trying to get as much information. I made a few contacts on the islands, just trying to find out if there's any if anything remotely similar to that type of dog, that even alive or working, absolutely anything. And I managed to track down a couple of uh, dogs who were still working, who were still very much a similar type. And it kind of began from there, a couple of Portuguese gentlemen who were interested in the breed and, you know, wanted to take up a project, kind of got involved. And Mr. Jose is one of them, and he's kind of taken on the project himself of trying to recreate the breed using not only dogs from the source that he's managed to, to find, but he's used a couple of different breeds um, to kind of help get the type that he um, is looking for to recreate the breeds. And I think he's doing very well. I mean, again, it's not something, you know, you can always tell from someone's intentions what, you know, for, for, you know, from someone's actions what their intentions are. I mean, he's bred now a couple of litters and he's not made a penny. All the puppies have been given out for free to various to diverse owners. Some are just pet owners. Some have got, some are hunters, some farmers so they'll be worked and tried and will be living in the, the variety of environments just to get an idea of what the breed's like you know what you know what their traits are like what can they do what they can't do how they respond in different scenarios and de different situations and then i think he'll go from there really yeah that's awesome i i think that's a, a great endeavor is there any other uh, 
resurrections that that you know of that people are trying? Not, I mean, um, not that I know of. I mean, there's a lot of people doing a lot of good work. Um, and this is, we go back, we've, we've touched on it. The internet's a great mm-hmm. tool. But it's also, you know, it can be also a very wicked tool because unless you're not, you're never going to please everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, you're never going to please everyone. And there's a lot of people, you know, slandering people and backstabbing people. And and I just think to myself, you know, you know, there's no need for it. When someone's doing their own thing and they're happy what with the dogs they're feeding, you know, nothing more than to support these people and there's you know there's people doing a lot of great work with the English Bull Terrier there's people doing a lot of good work with the Rhodesian Ridgeback um I've actually just recently met a couple in America doing a lot of good work with the Dog de Bordeaux there's a lot of people out there doing good work with different breeds you know their chosen breed you know there's obviously I know a few I know a gentleman doing a lot of good things with the wheat in um I think these people need to be supported, you know, whatever yeah. sense of not, there's no point in backstabbing people or slagging people off. That's their chosen breed, it's their project, and, and people should be allowed and entitled to do what they want with their spare time and their and their efforts and their money. And if they feel that's what they want to do, then, you know, and that's the whole point of the page is to support people like that and showcase their work and showcase their dogs. I mean, I, I mean, I, you know, my don't get me wrong. I'm not claiming that. I'm not saying that everyone should have working dogs and everyone needs to work their dogs because that's not the case. What I'm, my thing is promoting a healthy dog, good structure, and just able to have, live a happy life, whether it's as a pet or as a working dog. It should be comfortable in its own skin and live a happy, healthy lifestyle um it doesn't matter what breed it is it doesn't matter what type of dog it is it doesn't matter what the purpose of the breed is you know breeders can still breed a healthy fit structurally sound dog without you know without much effort really it's not that it's it's not rocket science it's just a lot of people to line their pockets and make some money are breeding um dogs to the extreme breeding from unhealthy dogs in the first place and that's and those and those health issues are being passed on to have been passed on to um to the puppies and this day and age shouldn't i just don't think it should be happening especially with the internet and you know you're so you're so much more aware of different breeders and different males and different bitches and different puppies there's so much information out there um, and so many people out there to contact and speak to um there's no reason why people can't get the best male or the best bitch to breed from and the best puppy that they can get. Um, you know, whatever people are into, people are into pets, French ring training, man work, um, obedience, agility, um, field work, whatever people are into. That's brilliant. I mean, I've always, my thing is, some type of work is better than no work you know it's it's a lot better than being doing a bit of agility or doing a bit of ratting or a bit of um you know whatever than not doing nothing at all with a dog mm-hmm. the dog is eager to to do that type of work mm-hmm. um so i take my hat off to anyone who is bothered to do to get out and about with their dog, whether it's tracking and ratting or, you know, agility work or man work or even just simple little games they do their dogs, you know, just um, even just pointing dogs, being out and about and um, uh, pointing different game, whatever, you know, whatever people are into, I, you know, my hat's off goes out because I always think doing something is better than doing nothing. What I like, I'm one of these people that I like, I get energy off people and doing the book and meeting people and speaking to different people, I get a massive energy from people who are wanting to do something different, who are wanting to do better for their chosen breed, whatever that is and whatever breed it is. And if I can help or support them in any way, then I, I will. Um, 
whether that's just posting pictures or writing an article or you know writing about the breed of my book or whatever whatever I can do I I do people need to be supported instead of being criticized because there is a lot of people out there doing good things with different breeds no absolutely absolutely well, I don't want to take too much of your time because I would definitely like to be able to bring you back on whenever you had some free time next month yeah. or two. Um, I, there's tons more that we could talk about, and so but I, I don't want to take up too much of your time today. And um, but, Just give me a shout if you ever want to speak again. Give me a shout. No problems at all. Uh, any questions or anything at all, give me a shout. Uh, like I said, it might take yeah. me a bit longer um, to yeah. come back, but I'm always happy to help. Definitely, I'll uh, probably uh, think of a subject or two, and 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 just uh, in a month or so, and 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 try to hit you up and and talk about that and go from there. So I appreciate your time, and uh, definitely you're an inspiration of mine, and and uh, I'll much. always I'll always be following you. So thank you. Thank you very much. Cheers for having me. All the best. Thank you. You too. Bye. Bye.